In this lecture, I'm going to discuss a class of nanomaterials called inorganic nanowires. Uh, the nanomaterials are the backbone, you know, for the development of uh, nanotechnology-based products. Um, in my earlier lectures, I did um, talk about um, the wonderful properties and applications of uh, carbon nanotubes and graphene. Uh, in this lecture, I'm going to focus on inorganic nanowires. First, I will give some brief background on inorganic nanowires. Then I will focus on uh, how to grow these uh, nanowires uh, and then show some results uh, you know, from the growth and the characterization. Uh, finally, I will focus on uh, some of the applications for these uh, nanowires. This looks essentially like an eye chart. Um, in fact, all the materials um, are the elements in the periodic table. To give some examples, silicon and germanium and metals like aluminum and copper, uh, all of these elements, you know, we have used them in the last two or three decades in microelectronics uh, in the form of thin films. These thin films were made possible by growth techniques such as chemical vapor deposition, uh, metal organic chemical vapor deposition, molecular beam epitaxy, powdering, uh, and a variety of other techniques. But in the last uh, decade or so, all of these materials, and even you know, some of the compounds like gallium arsenide and indium ph phosphide, you know, the research community has managed to grow them in the form of you know, one-dimensional nanowires. So the variety of materials that can be grown in the form of nanowires, they cover the entire electromagnetic spectrum, you know, going from a UV you know, to even long infrared wavelength. Or if you look at band gap, you know, band gap as low as um, 0.05 EV you know, to something as high as you know, 3.5 EV. So what is the motivation for uh, growing these materials in the form of nanowires? Uh, when you grow the uh, materials in the form of um, uh, one-dimensional wires, you can get in a quantum confinement when the radius reaches values you know, below the Bohr radius you know, for that material. Uh, in fact, the band gap begins to increase you know, when the diameter of the nanowire goes below the Bohr radius. Uh, it's also possible to get very high quality uh, single crystal nanomaterials with very well defined uh, surface properties. You can also uh, dope these nanowires and finally these nanowires uh, enable truly bottom-up uh, integration uh, to make uh, devices and systems. The growth methods available uh, for making these nanowires include use of you know templates these templates actually could be in something like you know zeolites or um, anodized alumina templates. These templates allow you to grow uh, one-dimensional uh, nanowires you know, from standard precursors for a given material. Uh, but the issues about using a template-based approach uh, include um, difficulties of removing the template when it is time for you to integrate the nanowires um, into uh, making devices. So in that sense, the device integration is not really straightforward. It's possible to achieve you know, uniform pore size, but if you're trying to grow over a large wafer, such as let's say a 200 millimeter wafer, it's not clear whether you can get uniform pore size across such a large area. The next approach is you know, laser ablation. Uh, laser ablation technique is not truly scalable and uh, um, it's also not suitable for incorporating in the device fabrication sequence. The last method uh, is called the uh, vapor liquid solid approach. Uh, it is very similar to chemical vapor deposition. Uh, one major difference uh, from the CVD is um, the need to use you know, some form of you know, catalyst. So the vapor liquid solid or the VLS technique uh, allows you to you know, prepare these nanowires using patterns. Large area is possible. The VLS technique, since it is very much similar to the chemical vapor deposition, is very amenable for integration um, in a device fabrication uh, scheme. Um, the issues currently facing the research community, as far as the VLS technique goes, 
And number one is control of the diameter of the uh, nanowire. Uh, how do you control the nanowire diameter uniformly across a large wafer, uh, let's say a 200 millimeter or 300 millimeter wafer? Um, would you need lithography? So these are some of the issues facing uh, the VLS community. So let me amplify the template-based technique a little more. The template, you know, as the name indicates, it, it contains uh, pores. Uh, so you can do selective deposition of the nano wire inside the openings of this template. So the, the, the pore size controls the diameter of the nano wire. So as long as you have desirable pore size and if you can control it uniformly across the entire wafer, then you can control the size and shape of the nano wires. So examples of the um, uh, templates include zeolites, molecular sieves, porous anodized aluminum oxide uh, films. Essentially, the anodized aluminum oxide is one of the mo most popular uh, templates uh, used by the nanowire community. Uh, it offers good stability and uh, insulating properties. Uh, people have been attempting to control the density and uniformity of the pores. It allows you to integrate the template uh, into a device fabrication seam. It's kind of questionable. The anodized aluminum template has been used to grow a variety of uh, nano wires in the literature. Synthesis of nano wires, you know, by the vapor liquid solid approach. I mentioned the vapor liquid solid approach is very similar to uh, CVD. Essentially, uh, if you're trying to grow something like silicon, then you can use the same precursor that you normally use to grow silicon in the form of thin film. For example, silane you know, mixed with hydrogen or silicon tetrachloride you know, mixed with um, you know, hydrogen. If you're trying to grow um, gallium arsenide, it could be trimethyl gallium you know, mixed with arsine. So in that sense, if, you know, the natural question is, if you're using the same precursor you would normally use when you're trying to grow a thin film, uh, then what makes it possible to grow a nano wire instead of a thin film? Um, and in this particular case, we are not even going to use a template. So um, what makes it possible uh, to grow a nano wire under the VLS scheme is a, a catalyst. The catalyst typically that you find in the literature uh, is uh, gold. Uh, you know, we will go over the uh, various possibilities of, for catalysts in a minute. But the catalyst under the growth conditions, you know, which is fairly high temperature, it could be anywhere from 500 to you know, 900 degrees centigrade. Under that temperature, the catalyst is in a simple molten form. So your precursors in the vapor form, they get dissolved into the, the molten catalyst particle. When the supersaturation is reached, then uh, the particle will begin to precipitate uh, the material in the form of a nano wire. So that's why this is called a vapor liquid solid. The vapor is a precursor. A precursor is in the, is in the form of vapor. Um, the uh, catalyst is in the form of molten liquid, and the solid is the, you know, the resultant product, you know, which is a nano wire. So typical laboratory equipment in VLS growth involves a you know, quartz tube, uh, which is inserted in a furnace. Uh, it, it would be preferable to have a two-zone furnace, so that way uh, the, uh, the, the first zone can be used to create the uh, uh, precursors. Uh, and then the second zone can have the substrate uh, heated to the specific temperature uh, and the growth can occur in the second zone. The growth zone uh, temperature can be completely different from the temperature in the first zone you know, which creates a precursor. So in that sense it's ideal to have uh, two separate um, zones uh, with independent uh, temperature control. Now let me talk about the precursor you know, sources. The precursor could be in the form of a powder. For example, something like zinc oxide or tin oxide and various oxides can be grown uh, using a high purity uh, in a powder. So you can keep the powder in a single board and then allow you know, sublimation of that powder, which will create the uh, source vapor. Uh, other materials that could be grown using powder source include you know, germanium, you know, germanium telluride. In all these cases, it's preferable to have very high purity powders, you know, for example, 99.39s you know, and uh, placed in a quartz board. 
Um, uh, sometimes the sublimation temperatures uh, could be too high. In that case, you can mix a powder source you know, with graphite and that is called the carbothermal reduction. When you do that, the reaction temperature could be typically lower than the um, you know, sublimation temperature of the same powder. You can also use you know, two or more powder sources if you want to grow ternary compounds. Uh, for example, uh, you can mix a uh, germanium telluride powder with um, antimony you know, telluride powder in order to grow germanium antimony telluride you know, nanowires. Uh, so finally, uh, you can also use gas and vapor sources. As I mentioned earlier on, uh, you can use silane hydrogen or silicon tetrachloride and hydrogen if you want to grow silicon nanowires. You know, these are exactly the same sources that you would uh, use when you try to grow uh, silicon in the form of a two-dimensional thin film. Uh, likewise, um, you know, germane and hydrogen for germanium nanowires, uh, organometallic sources such as trimethyl gallium, trimethyl aluminum, arsine, phosphine, etc. you know, for 3,5 compounds. Now let's talk about the catalyst metal. When you look at the literature, gold will be the you know, choice in most of the publications, but you know, gold is not uh, really desirable, uh, particularly in, in semiconductor uh, manufacturing, because uh, gold happens to modulate in you know, a carrier recombination in both N-type and P-type materials. See, this, these uh, you know, gold atoms actually can transform into electrically active in you know, a low mobility substitutional sites. And so in that sense, it's preferable to, you know, to look for alternatives uh, to gold uh, to grow uh, in a variety of nanowires. Um, in fact, you know, many of the elements that you find in group four and group five and six and seven have been used as uh, catalysts you know, for um, you know, growing nanowires. Iridium and platinum are two of the uh, elements you know, which haven't worked well. The rest of them all have been used to grow a variety of nanowires such as silicon, tin oxide and and other types of uh, oxides. There is a loose correlation between the growth density of the uh, nanowire and the melting point of the, um, of the metal. For example, uh, if the melting point is very high, you know, if you were to use something like you know, zirconium, then the growth density that you get is very low because the, these uh, metals essentially serve as a soft template you know, for growing the nanowires. So if the melting point is very high, then you can naturally see that the growth density could go down. So these are images of some of the um, uh, inorganic nanowires. For example, silicon and germanium, a variety of nitrides like gallium nitride, aluminum nitride, indium nitride. Uh, and a whole variety of oxides such as indium oxide, tin oxide, and then uh, other materials uh, like 2,6 materials such as gallium antimonide, indium antimonide, uh, cam cadmium telluride, uh, and then phase change materials like germanium telluride and germanium antimonide. So all these nanowires have been grown uh, by a number of groups across the world. Uh, all, these nanowires, as you can uh, see from these uh, scanning electron microscope images, very long, and when they are very long, they're uh, kind of curvy, so they look like a mat of nanowires. You know, the diameters, you know, could be anywhere from 5 nanometer to 50, 60, even, you know, 100 nanometers, uh, and the, the length actually depends on the growth time. Uh, it could be several microns long. So these are random-oriented uh, nanowires. On the other hand, you can also grow these nanowares you know, nice and vertical. The image on the left is um, zinc oxide nanowares, you know, which are nice and vertical. Uh, but if you notice, the diameter distribution is fairly random. When the diameter is random, then the corresponding height also would be random because there is a correlation you know, between the diameter and the height of the nanowires. Um, on the other hand, if you really want to control um, both the diameter and the height, uh, then it is um, necessary uh, to pattern the um, you know, catalyst particles. Um, what happens is if you don't pattern the um, uh, catalyst particle, uh, the way you get the metal catalyst is by sputtering. 
Um, for example, again, take uh, you know, gold as an example. You can sputter one or two nanometer gold, a thin gold layer uh, at the growth temperature of approximately 800 degrees centigrade or so. This uh, thin film of gold will uh, you know, break into you know, droplets. Um, the droplet size um, are, are the diameter uh, is going to be you know, fairly random uh, over a mean diameter. So this will be like a Gaussian distribution. Um, w this diameter uh, can be increased or decreased uh, by making the uh, gold layer you know, thicker or thinner. So as you can see, uh, you know, when you have a Gaussian distribution of diameters, then the, nano, uh, the, the, the height distribution is going to follow you know, the diameter distribution. Um, on the other hand, if you can precisely control the diameter of you know, all the catalyst particles, then you can uniformly um, you know, control their height also. So that's possible if you, if you pattern uh, uh, the catalyst uh, uh, particles like dots. So that's what has been done you know, for the germanium nanowires you know, shown on the right side of this uh, uh, view graph. So here, uh, you know, the gold catalyst particles were patterned using lithography and the size of the particles were controlled. So each of the nanowire then has the same diameter and the same height. The transmission electron um, microscope image in the inset, you know, shows a single uh, germanium nanowire, approximately 25 nanometer uh, diameter. And what you see at the top, uh, you know, which looks like a cupcake, is the gold catalyst particle. In the vapor liquid solid technique, when the nanowire grows, it carries the catalyst particle forward, okay? So the catalyst particle always ends up at the tip, uh, which is actually a good thing because um, when you're ready to do device fabrication, uh, you can simply, you know, remove the particle either by acid wash or something like chemical mechanical polishing. Uh, so this image you know, shows silicon nanowires you know, which are vertical and they were grown using a silicon tetrachloride hydrogen system and the nanowires are roughly you know, 40 to 80 nanometer in diameter. The catalyst particles, uh, again, they, it was not patterned. That's why the diameter is uh, random because uh, the catalyst was done as a thin film. So the resulting uh, height distribution is about one to two microns you know, there is a, a wide variation. Only a very narrow set of conditions yield, you know, vertical wires. If you end up using very high silicon tetrachloride, you know, concentration, for example, greater than 0.25%, uh, uh, or if you use high temperature, you know, greater than 950 degrees centigrade, then you end up getting really thin, curvy wires as opposed to vertical nanowires. Uh, so these are zinc oxide nanowires, you know, grown on M sapphire. Again, these are, you know, nice and vertical nanowires and the diameter distribution are pretty much, you know, random because uh, gold tin film was used. And as I mentioned earlier, at the growth temperature, um, the tin film breaks into uh, droplets and the droplet uh, diameter distribution is random. And so as a result, you end up getting in a random distribution for diameter of the grown nanowires.